introduction. Um, I'm presenting this work on behalf of my co-authors, uh, Yusef from uh, Saarland University and Andreas from uh, the Max Planck Institute for Informatics. And today we'll talk about skull conduct and why, how we can use audio to authenticate and identif identify users of uh, iOS computers. So iOS computers store a lot of personal information and data, such as short messages from friends or pictures from your last trip with your family. And making sure that these information are not accessed by others is a major challenge. And the main challenge there lies in the interaction technique, because, for example, uh, when you use Google Glass, the interaction techniques are very limited. So you, you can use speech input, or you can use uh, gestures or touch input on the frame of the glass. But these methods are not well suited for authenticating, because, well, you can't simply speak your password loud, for example, that people in the room would notice immediately that. Um, at the same time, identifying uh, users is important. So, for example, to personalize uh, the applications on, on a device such as Google Glass. So, for example, if a surgeon wants to do surgery, he wants uh, to make sure that every application is aligned in a way that he's used to and not the way uh, his colleagues have lined the applications because they share the device. And that are the two challenges we want to address with uh, our project. Um, how do we do that? We use audio as some sort of fingerprint. And uh, similar to the work of uh, Daniel, we want to use it implicitly. And how do we do that? We use the integrated bone conduction speaker. That's basically a speaker that uses not the air to transmit the audio, but uh, the bone or the skull of the user and the integrated microphone. And what, what we are doing, we are playing back an audio file. And at the same time, when uh, the, the audio travels through the head of the user, we record it in the front uh, with the microphone. And uh, as we can see, the signal changed. So we call that characteristic frequency response. Uh, and that's because um, the skull of the user uh, modulates the signal. And since every head or every skull is different with regards to the size or the composition of the different uh, parts of the skull, such as the bone or the skin, uh, this response is unique for, for a specific person. And in order to explore this uh, idea, we uh, developed a system that consists of a Google Glass and an application. Uh, the application consists of four different parts, a playback part that basically plays back an audio file, and a recording part that records the same uh, file immediately again. And uh, then the feature extraction we used for that uh, metal frequency capture coefficients that's mainly known from uh, speech recognition or speaker recognition. And as a classification step, so the step that identifies user based on the features, we use the nearest neighbor approach. So we conducted a data recording session. In total, we invited 10 participants, and we recorded 10 recordings uh, from each participant. And we did that in two sets of five recordings. And in between, the users took off the glasses and took them on again so that we uh, uh, deal with the different placement of the glass. So when, the, when they put on the glass again, they're probably slightly different placed so that we can exclude that as source of the variance. Um, in total, each recording was 23 seconds long, and we used the white noise signal because it contains all the frequencies evenly. Uh, and we did the study in a very controlled setting. So we used a quiet room. Uh, nobody else except the participant was in the room. There was no technology except the glass in the room, no laptop, and so on. So that we just have a control setting with the noise generated by the glass and the recording. OK, looking at the results, that is the power spectral density diagram. Uh, that plots basically the energy that's in the signal for each uh, frequency. That are uh, two recordings from two different users. The red and the blue is a recording before and after taking on and off the glass. And as you can see, uh, 
slightly the signal changed when taken on and off the glass, but the main structure is roughly the same. But the difference between two users is way bigger, and that's what we basically use uh, to identify and authenticate users. And uh, we did that using a tenfold cross-validation. Uh, we removed one participant that served as an attacker in this case, and we removed one set of another participant we want to identify or authenticate. And as a training set, we put the other set of uh, the recordings from the particular user we want to identify in the training set, in addition to the eight other participants. And our results show that we can identify users uh, with 97% accuracy. And uh, for the authentication, we calculate an equal error rate, so the rate where the true acceptance rate and the false rejection rate is equal of 6.9%. Uh, furthermore, we uh, looked into how long such a signal should be in order to serve as a biometric, and uh, we found out that the signal that's one second long is long enough to, uh, to do the authentication identification process. Um, signals that are not that long uh, will result in a lower equal error rate. Okay. Um, we did the study in a very controlled setting, so there was no background noise, which definitely would influence our results. Uh, so the next step is conduct a study in a crowd, like you can see in the picture. Does our approach work in the same environment, or does it just work in a, a lab setting? That's definitely something we need to do. Uh, we need also to improve the algorithm. We use off-the-shelf MFCC algorithms that are not, per, uh, not directly built for our approach, but for something similar, and we just adopted it. Um, furthermore, the question is whether it works for, for a broader audience. So uh, does our approach work with hundreds or thousands of users, or is the uniqueness of the scan not good enough for that? And last but not least, um, the audio file. We used in the study a white noise signal of 23 seconds, which is not that pleasant to hear to. Um, we think about, especially as we found out that one second is enough, if we can use something like the feedback you get when you interact with Google Glass, for example, the plongs and the sounds you receive when you send a message. Is that enough in order to authenticate or identify users? So that's basically it. Uh, as a take-home message, Skullconduct is a biometric system that uses bone conduction of sound to identify and authenticate users on iWare computers. So thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take your questions. <laughs> questions? Hi, Florian Schaub from Carnegie Mellon. Um, cool work. Uh, thank you. One question I have is, does the placement of the microphone play a role? So Google Class is obviously not built for this kind of application, but it still works really well. So I'm wondering if you place the microphone closer to the speaker, um, does it make a difference? I think it, uh, in our study it doesn't make a big difference because it's not a noisy room, it was completely quiet. But if you go into like a crowded setting, it definitely can help to increase accuracy when the microphone points directly at yeah, the audio source, basically. Hi, Lainey Iannucci at Five Networks. Two questions. One is, have you thought of playing around with a different frequency of sound, one that wouldn't be even audible to the human ear, so it wouldn't be as unpleasant? And then two, um, a, similar to this question with the microphone, are you concerned with someone else being able to record what the sound you know, ultimately is after it is conducted through the skull? Mm -hmm. So first question, yes, we thought about it, but we didn't do it, unfortunately. But it's definitely <laughs> something we want to look into in the future. So, yeah, uh, one approach would be use sounds that you hear anyway. The other one would be to, to use sounds you can't hear. So it's not that unpleasant compared to uh, uh, white noise. And your second question, uh, I actually didn't thought about that. Um, what I think... One needs to figure out if that works, if you can simply uh, record it from, from distance. Um, the bone conduction speaker is built in a way that the sound should be private in terms of that others can't hear it. 
Uh, obviously, you can hear it, otherwise it wouldn't work. But uh, it's not that loud, so you can't basically record something like that from a distance of a couple of meters. You have to be close to do it. But yeah, we didn't try that out, but we definitely will. Thank you. Hi, very interesting stuff. Stuart Schechter, Microsoft Research. Uh, do you know, um, do you have any sense for how much you're detecting bone conduction versus things that may be more variable over time, like uh, the, the other materials that are in the skull? If someone's congested, they're going to have more material back there. If someone's wearing an earring, mm -hmm. if someone's wearing hair gel that might be between, uh, are, were you collecting data from different sessions where uh, people might have been dressed differently and had uh, different hydration levels and so on? Definitely, again, something one should look into. Uh, we didn't do that. We did the session at the same day, uh, so both recording sets. Um, my feeling is that uh, the bone conduction speaker is very closely to, to the head, and I think the influence of as long as you have not too long hair should not be that big. Um, but, yeah, again, I have no data to support my statement. Hi, thanks for the presentation. My name is Vikram from Open University, UK. Uh, so my question is why, why bone conduction for sound for authentication? I mean, is it better than the tactile input, normal tactile input, or just making patterns like over the skin or something? So it's an implicit way. So there are scenarios in which you can't interact with your device. And it's a way that uh, pre uh, prevents others from, uh, you know, um, knowing your password because yeah, you just stand there and do nothing and it's very hard to, to even know that you currently get authenticated. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, ben Jow, UCSB. So